All right, welcome to the Multi-Cloud Expedition Series, episode number two. Excited to be here and excited to have a number of uh, uh, subject matter experts from around VMware. Real quick recap on what uh, the episode series is. So there's a, a range of challenges that come with managing a multi-cloud environment. Uh, everything from cost to uh, developing applications to observability, you name it. When you add multiple clouds to an IT infrastructure, it comes with problems. And in fact, our customers have described themselves as being many times in cloud chaos, uh, whether it be from acquiring companies through mergers and acquisition, uh, lines of businesses that spin up cloud properties, plus that important infrastructure that's running today in data centers and on-prem. All of that makes up the multi-cloud environment. And so in this series, we're here to take, take on a number of different challenges and questions and bring in subject matter experts in order to help describe and show the product that can help folks go from cloud chaos to cloud smart. So today we're gonna to be talking about uh, three things, three important pieces uh, and the fundamentals of them, really looking at observability, number one, then uh, number two, uh, cost, and then number three, security. And so we'll run through those today and we'll talk through some of the challenges that our customers are having and then see some of the solutions. So to begin with, uh, I want to welcome to the live episode, Rachna. So Rachna is going to be joining us here. All right. Hey, Rachna, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Alexander? Good. Why don't you uh, take a quick moment to introduce yourself to the audience and what you do at VMware? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Rachna Srivastava. I'm a director of product marketing here at VMware, and I am responsible for our observability solution, which is now named uh, ARIA Operation for Applications, mm -hmm. formerly known as VR Ops, which is now, now ARIA Operations. Uh, Log Insights, uh, which is now known as ARIA Operations for Logs, and Network Insights, which is now known as ARIA Operations for Networks. Awesome. All right. So in that kind of vast product set, right, the, one of the big challenges that, that that is tackling is helping customers understand what's going on in their environment. And this is a question we get quite a bit from customers. Uh, I, I get the chance to brief customers from all over the world. And as they are acquiring, whether it be, again, organically, these different product, these different uh, cloud environments, one of the first questions is what is what is going on in my environment? Just give me some observability, right? And then from there, there is a question of, well, how does this, how can I make sense of this, right? In order to solve problems. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how that, or maybe some of the challenges that customers have and, and uh, how they get solved. Yeah, definitely. So what we see is, you know, as uh, enterprises have started to adopt multi-cloud strategies, cloud native applications, but at the same time, they also manage their traditional application estates. So they have sort of a both because we're not going to see a shift completely from one or the other. We're sort of seeing a continuum or a range where customers are in their cloud adoption journey. And they're starting to build applications on containers, on microservices, just on native public cloud. So at this point, what if they need to figure out or deduce where problem lies in anything, right? As they're trying to troubleshoot, whether the problem lies in an application or an infrastructure, some of the challenges they find is that there is no easy way to deduce what layer to inv investigate and where the problem might lie. There's no easy way to correlate infrastructure, container and application level issues. And they're constantly dealing with silo tools and so they have to switch between tools. At the same time, we're also starting to see an IT center of excellence that is starting to become the to, to become more mainstream, where IT teams are coming together, and we're starting to see a platform security ops type of team getting formed that's bringing together some of the SRE capabilities, IT admin capabilities. So the need is really to find something that provides more of a holistic view. Uh, so that they can get to issues faster. 
Yeah. So the cut, you know, what, so the customers are, are getting, let's just say there is some application. It's not performing like it should the output, whatever the output may be, right. If it's, whether it could be a uh, HR app, it could be a sales app. And then in comes a ticket that says, Hey, this isn't working. Right. And I hear often now you mentioned siloed tools, right? Because there's a tool for this cloud and there's a tool for that cloud. There's a tool for the network. There's a tool for the infrastructure and operations. So um, one customer had said, you know, I've, I've become a swivel chair admin, right? But a swivel chair is up, one console over here, one console over here, one console over here. And then how do we correlate and triangulate that information? So. Exactly. Yeah, we've got a uh, you 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 put together a great demo of kind of showing the first stage of this, which is okay. The ticket comes in, and maybe you could describe it a little bit more as a setup, but then we'll play the video. Yeah, yeah. So the demo you're about to see is exactly what we just talked about, which is an application is slow. Where do you figure out? Where do you start? Where does the problem exist? The ticket is if it goes to the application team. Sometimes the application team may not. The, the problem may not lie with the application. So you may want to look at the underlying infrastructure. And again, the swivel chair in action, because you're looking at all these different tools to figure out where the problem lies. This demo is going to showcase um, our integration with ARIA operation for applications and ARIA operation, which is VR ops. And it shows how with this integration, just within one tool, you can quickly get to the problem. Yeah, it also yeah, what we're, I was going to say, it's, it also kind of helps funnel those tickets in to the right place or those kind of questions, as opposed to uh, if a ticket gets routed to the wrong, the wrong group, they just say, oh, not my problem. And then there's a delay, right? Who knows yeah. if that takes an hour, two hours, two days, depending on the groups that are going. And in so, this example, what you're going to see is that the ticket first comes to the infrastructure team. Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and play that so uh, we can see how that what this looks like. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Eisenberg. I'm going to give you a quick demo of a full stack uh, troubleshooting between using ARIA operations and ARIA operations for applications. So we're going to first start in the um, in ARIA operations. I'm at the ARIA operations uh, main dashboard. And I'm going to, and I've just gotten a ticket about a K8s environment that um, that a K, an application that's based in our one of our K8s environments, and that this application is running slow. So I'm going to be going into our dashboards, and I'm going to go into my recent ones, and I'm going to my K8s overview dashboard, and I'm going to open up. Now, again, the app they, that they talk, we're talking about is based on our um, Amazon environment in EKS. So that's already selected. I'm going to open up my alerts, my cluster alerts. And what you can see here is I've got a series of pod events. But if I scroll down, I also have a pod, of, a node event. So that node event is showing me that, that, hey, I've got all these pods that are having issues. And I've also got the node itself is having an issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill into this node by clicking on it. And I'm, now I'm focused on it in the object browser. Um, again, we're bringing a, uh, a subset of data that we collect in ARIA operations for applications into ARIA operations. And you can see that this is a K8s node. Uh, the source of that is uh, vmware.wavefront.com, which is the URL for ARIA operations for applications. And it is a case no, node in this particular case. So I really want to start figuring out what's going on with this. And notice I've got the pod memories and the node uh, errors listed here as well in the summary page. But if I drill into metrics, I can see the relationship of how things are related uh, inside this environment. I can see that my node, which is right there, is related to the application cluster, as well as this EKS cluster running on Amazon. Now, if I click on, double click on this and drill in, I'll see what is that EKS cluster related to. And you can see that it's related to the AWS environment. Where is it running? What is it running on? How is it configured? 
that kind of thing. But we're not here to drill into AKS um, or EKS, excuse me. Um, so I really want to take a look at that node. So I'm going to go back to my um, my metric screen, and I'm going to now double click again on that um, that node. I can open also expand this out and look at all the different pods that are running on it, and I can see which ones are having errors and which ones aren't. And I can also then, if I wanted to, drill into the cluster itself. Now, things are running slow, so I wanted to start taking a look around. And I'll go into my metrics. One of the things that slows things down is memory. And I can see that there's issues going on with memory. So I'm going to jump into that. And I'm going to go into my uh, utilization and see how much memory is used. And then I'm also going to see what my capacity, my memory capacity is. Now, these metrics are also coming in for ARIA operations for applications, a uh, part of the uh, management pack that integrates the two, the, the two tools. And I could see that I've got um, over eight gig of memory, and I'm using about uh, 50, just under 50% of that memory uh, on a regular basis uh, since 12 o'clock. So it says, this doesn't tell me much of a problem. It says, hey, what? The, the node that's running here has got plenty of memory left over. So it's really not an infrastructure issue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to ARIA operations for applications using this actions hyperlink that we supply. And it will bring me in context into my ARIA applications dashboard for Kubernetes nodes. Now it already pre-fills out my cluster name. Yeah, that's you know that's a great transition point because if we kind of play this back a little bit and we think, okay, the, that infrastructure and operations admin has got a ticket, then they have done their investigation, right? Found that, they, and they're, by the way, they're able to see all this information of what's going on in the cloud. They're looking at the memory, memory looks okay, the metrics they can see, and it could have ended there. They could have just said, you know, wipe their hands of it and point the finger somewhere else. Uh, instead, and we're going to get to this in a second, right? It pivots and that same person can begin to investigate in another direction. Exactly. So, yeah. And so, is, go ahead. Uh, you know, what we call sort of passing the baton, right? You're, you're, you're basically saying, I've done my part. I can within the same application within this, this literally will take a minute or two to figure out what's going on. I kind of have pinpointed where the problem exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's hugely important because that the, the first part of it, right? VROPS as it's commonly known, VMware uh, or vRealize operations has been running and helping, uh, you know, helping our customers run their data centers for years and years and years, very reliably. And now having that view into what's going on to their cloud applications is su super important. So combine those two, hugely important. Now we're gonna, we're gonna switch here and continue in this demonstration to show how we further investigate going from, okay, checkbox IT operations is, um, you know, looks good, but now let's go see what's going on in the applications. Was there anything and, else you wanted to set up for the, the next part? Yes, so in, you know, here what we've done is, we're simulating the problem is with the application in this particular demo. So we have capped the memory usage to 50%, which is not common, but every organization will have their own threshold for memory usage. Just to kickstart this, uh, this problem, we've gone ahead and capped it at 50%, and then it'll show where the problem lies. Perfect. Okay, let's go ahead and, and roll the, uh, the next demonstration. So what I have to do is tell you that this is a demo environment. Big surprise, I'm doing a demo with a demo environment. But I've set max memory on this node to 50%. So the only thing that we can use is 50%. And that's why we're getting the error um, at such a low level. But I don't understand what's being used inside my environment that could be using all that memory. So again, I could look at um, bytes received, uh, nodes uh, data transferred, things like that. I can get all sorts of other good information. But really what I want to find out is what is the application doing that is running on this node, uh, running on the pods that are running in this node. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to the top of the screen. I'm going to switch to my applications and I'm going to go to my application service dashboard. 
Now, the first thing I'm going to do is switch to my EKS Hotel Broken demo, which is a, a application, which is the broken application that we've built for this demo. And you can see right away that I've got my requests, my errors, my duration, my red metrics back and find out that, oh, we've got a problem within the application. I've got an application that's making too many requests against a particular pod. The pod, the Kubernetes cannot expand, add another pod because it's at 50, already at 50% of memory and we have max memory set at 50%. So we're artificially making the amount of memory too low for this demo, but it shows you that here's a number of requests. We should have gotten a new pod. In a, a normal world, this would have created, uh, Kubernetes would have spun up a new pod and serviced these requests, but we didn't want to blow up the whole system. So we just set our max memory down to 50%. Anyway, that's it. We troubleshooted. We were able to look from hardware, from our infrastructure, in this case, a cloud provider, all the way into our application code and be able to find out what's going on. Thank you, hope this was helpful and I'll talk to you the next time. So between those two, we just cut across quite a few to tools because um, that one looks like it was in AWS. Was that uh, right, that particular yeah. one? How, ha however, would this work across any cloud? Yes, we, as far as the solution, ARIA um, operations or applications, we do support applications running on any cloud. So when a customer finds themselves with, with stuff in AWS, stuff in Azure, stuff in uh, Google Cloud, they can pull in those different pieces and be able to see, again, going back to, is this being able to troubleshoot across those different, what, what would otherwise be a siloed environment now being brought together. Exactly, that, that is the value of it. And really bringing in a, a multi-cloud environment, um, applications that are running, you know, you could, you could be running an application on a Kubernetes environment or any public cloud, but you have one place to kind of quickly drill in and see where the problem might lie. Yeah, the other one that, that brings to mind is just the correlation, right? Being able to yes. correlate, you know, all the way through uh, from a problem set and figure out which are the which are the key uh, possible problems versus which ones are not. So that exactly. also is big. And also seeing the relations of the different components and the entities that we saw in the first demo, which also brings a lot of uh, valuable information mm -hmm. to the to the administrator. And you mentioned at the beginning um, some of the centers of expertise that that customers are beginning to develop. So maybe take a minute to just share with us what is what is good look like, what is great look like maybe for customers who are trying to observe what's going on in that multi-cloud environment. Oh, so customers, so one is of course the fact that we're starting to see the SRE teams, the platform teams sort of come together and really figure out a holistic view that is required to get that single source of truth visibility. So IT owners or application owners can then get better insights when they bring together all of these separate events that kind of come together to bring a full picture, which is typically, you know, we look at end-to-end -end metrics, events, traces, logs, so a, a good observability solution should be able to pull from all these four typically known as MELT, metrics, events, uh, logs, and traces, to be able to provide that holistic view that's required uh, to really figure out where the problem might be. And it's important for it to be in context. So if you're pulling a log that's coming from some other area, we're able to then quickly say in context, this was the metric associated with it things like that, so we can then troubleshoot and drill down into the problem easy. So for customers who might be, you know, let's say, uh, you know, the, the old expression is pulling their hair out because either they've got, you know, excessive downtime and they go and do kind of the, uh, the uh, post-mortem on it and they find out that a ticket was passed around for hours, days, right? With no clear owner and resolution, certainly something that they, you know, if they're trying to get their hands around that, uh, they want to take a look at uh, uh, ARIA operations and ARIA operations for applications. Or it's faster right. and management, uh, root cause analysis, and just, yeah, better SLAs.
Yeah, it's really the pairing of those two, which is the the differentiation, right? For VMware is to say, you got your ops over here. Now you got your apps over here. By the way, apps can be anywhere in any cloud. And we're going to bring those together so you can get faster, right? Mean time to resolution, yeah. better observability. So, you know, that, that kind of transition. So now let's assume that we've got the blocking and tackling on just some of the basic observability and problem solving. What would be the next thing that customers would want to look at in this category? You know, we also see capacity planning as a, a critical component that customers typically look at. So how do we really monitor cloud usage? How do we look at, you know, how much, you know, again, along the lines of what we just saw, can we figure out the usage of our Kubernetes environments and what are your operations for application and observability enables us to do is we can break down resource usage into smaller buckets for your Kubernetes clusters. And then we can look at alerts, dashboards, which are either out of the box or they're customized so that we can see how much resources are being consumed. And then these could be optimized. So again, it also leads into more efficiencies because if you're seeing um, over overly excessive use of your resources, then you can actually adjust or alter based on the information you collect from the dashboard. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the big benefits, of course, of being able to use the hyperscalers is that ability to scale, right? But that doesn't necessarily come into play if things are already throttled and there wasn't the right capacity planning. But it exactly. should go both ways, right? It should go both ways, meaning you want to make sure there's the right capacity, of course, as a administrator, as an IT leader for the applications that are delivering the business outcomes. Uh, at the same time, you don't want things to go off the charts when it comes to cost because a application has, has all of a sudden been misused in some way or was, I mean, uh, you know, there's a code problem, whatever it may be, and begins just consuming an enormous amount of resources that are uh, by no way free at all. And step one is to at least see who's using what, what are the resources that are being used. So bringing that visibility is the first step to figuring out what to do next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, that's a good segue as we think about capacity planning and capacity planning for, hey, everything costs money, right? Cost. So that's a pretty good segue into our next section. So Rasha, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for sharing your uh, expertise with the audience, as well as walking us through those different demonstrations. We're going to have you back at the end of the show for some live Q&A. And with that, we'll switch over to the next section of the show, which is talking about, and thank you, Rachna. See, thank you. see you again in a little bit. Um, switch over to the next big question that comes up with customers, which is, help me understand total costs, but then we need to go a lot deeper than that, need to be able to peel back the onion and understand the different components, who's spending this money, and then also some of the strategies around how do we more efficiently uh, spend that money. So joining me now is Lucas. Hey, Alexander, how's it going? Good, Lucas, how about yourself? Just living the dream over here. Won't stop snowing this winter. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah, Lu Lucas is a, uh, a tremendous snowboarder, so I uh, hope to join him someday out there and do some skiing with him uh, as he's out there tearing it up on the snowboard. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about cost. So uh, maybe help us a little bit understand, uh, give us a quick intro on how you fit in as a subject matter expert at VMware. Yeah, so I am on the product management team at Cloud Health, which is now called Aria Cost. Uh, focused on our data pipeline. And then I also sit on the Technical Advisory Council of the FinOps Foundation, which we'll be talking a bit about that, this term FinOps. And it is a sect of the Linux Foundation, just focused on setting the standards and pushing the industry forward for finance or fin, fin DevOps, as uh, we've been talking about it. Yeah, we're going to dig a little bit more into that. And you've got a great framework for how customers kind of mature in terms of uh, what do they think about first when they're worried about cost, right, as well as uh, governance in the multi-cloud. So let's go ahead and put that up there. And maybe you can walk us through what it looks like to, you know, how these what these different pieces are. Yeah, absolutely. So it all starts with visibility. 
And it might not be spend, we'll be focused on spend, but it could be security related where you realize, hey, I'm spending too much. I have misconfigurations that need to be followed up on. And as you improve that visibility, you start to optimize. You start to make improvements, find cost savings. And as you get smarter and as you understand your goals as a business, how the cloud works, how your infrastructure runs, you can start to build in some automation and some governance around that so that hopefully you can kind of take your hands off the wheel. I mean, engineers want to focus on writing applications and creating sweet code. And the last thing they want to do is worry about having to figure out what is the cost of a resource. So it's about helping build these best practices into their day-to-day, -day, building it into that automation. And so that at the end, hopefully we now are in the business integration where cloud costs have been integrated into everybody's day-to-day. -day. Ones that are using SaaS applications like Datadog, ServiceNow, potentially using uh, labor costs, things like support and professional services. And how you can tie all of those things together to be able to calculate a true, there's a term called unit economics, unit economic cost. You know, this is, a, I love this visual because on that left hand, right on the, uh, the Y axis, there's collaboration. Um, and the collaboration, as you've described, we've heard a lot about, you know, just DevSecOps. Certainly that's very popular terminology where dev development and security and operations are trying to come together more. You're really pointing out here now financial. And so you're saying, number one, visibility, absolutely security and compliance, you know, operations. We just saw that with Rachna and now financial management. But you have to work together on each of these different stages in order to, to be, let's say, best in class. Yeah, that's spot on. That's what we see the most mature organizations with FinOps teams have a collaboration between the finance team, the finance persona, the product manager, or the business-minded um, persona, and then the engineer. And this concept of the engineers are the ones that have the context of the application on how it should run. They're the ones that if we can get thinking about cost and have them having this as part of their day-to-day, -day, they're the ones that can actually take action to have positive impact on the product. So one of the terms they say about FinOps is FinOps is not about saving money. It's about making money. And that's how you can help do it is help enable those engineers in that faster time to market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're going to we're going to talk a little bit more about that. You have a, a good demo of where we get started with some of the visibility um, and then some of the optimization, because there's kind of the beginning, which is just can you aggregate my costs? But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Because uh, then the next set of questions start happening. So let's go ahead and roll the demo as you go through kind of that first layer of the onion and then the, uh, the next layers of the onion. All righty. So welcome to Cloud Health. This is what you see when you first log in. This is a default dashboard. We defaulted to AWS, but have support for many other clouds you could be defaulted and switched to. And... This is a fully customizable dashboard. So right now we have pulled in just pretty standard EC2, RDS, and S3 usage, but we could have customized ones for different personas, like going after an engineering or potentially even a containers one. So this will, you can see your AWS, Azure, GCP, and on-prem environment in one single view. But what we're going to do here is we're going to focus on first on the cloud health cost history report, specifically just under AWS. But this is a report that we offer for all clouds. And this looks pretty similar to probably what you're used to seeing from a cost explorer. But really where it gets exciting is when we start talking about perspectives. So today we're just going to be focusing on the line of business perspective. And you can think of this as our grouping engine. This contains business logic that is some automated, some manual, and allows Cloud Health to group costs in a way that makes sense to your business. So switching over to this, we've taken all of our costs, many millions per month, and grouped them into these seven or eight or so groups relative to the different lines of businesses. And so one of the ones we're also going to focus on today is the finance one. 
because just knowing that one has some good multi-cloud spend. So what we're going to do next is talk through how to create a perspective and what went into this and how it can help with a lot of the challenges our customers face around normalizing tagging, having spelling mistakes in tagging, transitioning between old to new tagging schemas. That's really where perspectives can become powerful. So I'm going to switch over to that, set up perspectives. Oh, quick, super fast, switched over. Here is the line of business perspective that we were looking at before. So let's switch over and focus on that finance group. And you can see right off the bat, here's a list of all of the rules that have been created, multiple rules for other clouds, for clouds. And right here is an example that we actually didn't have an environment tag in Azure. We called it business, but it doesn't really matter. And then we called it business in Azure or ENV in AWS, because what we're doing is taking all of the costs that meet any of these rules and then grouping them into this one finance group. So this is one way that you can get that visibility into your multi-cloud cost infrastructure. And now if you want to see what this actually looks like in the multi-cloud world, let's switch over to the multi-cloud cost history report. Here we're looking at it by day. We're a majority AWS shop, but have infrastructure elsewhere. Let's switch over to monthly, get a little bit more interesting. And when we switch over, let's go check out that finance line of business group. So switch there to there. And now I'm going to be able to see for our finance department, what's their spend look like across multiple clouds month to month? And so you can see here, looks like at some point they transitioned away from running anything on Azure and on-prem and are fully running on AWS and on Google. Yeah, great demo and great going from the, you know, the 50,000 foot view down into some of the advanced tagging capabilities. And it's probably worth for some of the audience members to back up a little bit. Um, and as an example, that tagging capability is something that exists, right, natively in all the different clouds. The challenge, right, that this solves is um, developers spinning those up and not giving very good names for it, right? So some might call it, yeah, finance, some might call it sandbox, maybe sandbox plus this, plus that. So um, there's all these different permutations. And then from there is where by normalizing it, right, through the perspective, perspectives tool, right, uh, is where you can get that visibility. And maybe you can give an example of where you've seen it put to good use at customers. Yeah, you're spot on. And I'd, we see it coming up daily with our GCP customers. So GCP only allows lowercase in their uh, tagging and labeling. And we see many customers, GCP was second. So they had AWS. They've established tagging schemas in AWS or Azure. And they had capitalization in there. And so just being able to group these different values, ENV all uppercase, ENV lowercase, has been a really strong kind of day zero um, implementation of Cloud Health. There's a lot more cool things that we can do, but this is one of those kind of day zero normalizing um, use cases. And it, it does sound like a kind of simple lowercase to uppercase, but the alternative was not pretty, I imagine. It was either writing something custom for a customer, or if you're finance, you're probably downloading spreadsheets of data, CSV files, and trying to then merge them. Is that it, it, exactly like adding up a bunch of cells? Because what we see typically is there'll be a budget per tag, but it's not budget per lowercase tag and budget per uppercase tag. So we're able to kind of help connect that story and remove all the after the fact uh, Excel work. Yeah. You know, one thing I thought of when I was watching that demo is uh, the idea of a, a big organization that has got a lot of, let's say, sandbox environments. And just being able to, tag, you know, if all those are assuming there's a tagging schema that's somewhat followed, being able to see, well, how much are we spending on just sandbox environments, right? Might be a good question. If you're a, a multi line of business type of organization, Maybe there's some centralization that should occur. Uh, I don't know. Have you come across anything of that nature? Yeah. I mean, we find sandbox environments are oftentimes 
the most have the most opportunity for savings or have the most unidentified or wasted cost. Um, and so definitely see a really strong use case for sandbox environments, managing them within cloud health, especially because oftentimes the guardrails put for those environments aren't as strong. Users could just launch a resource without having the really definitive production guardrails. So that's also another area that we'll see organizations focused on cleaning up. Yeah. And in today's environment, uh, you know, opening up uh, another spigot, so to speak, uh, is pretty easy, right? It's just a script. You hit it and boom, you've got another environment. It's not like the old days where you had to get a server, you had to install it, you know, so forth and so on. So the cost can, can jump pretty quickly. We see it too. I mean, as organizations want to get into new clouds, I mean, that, that's where that multi-cloud world becomes so difficult because they're running an AWS and then they want to use AI, ML, and GCP. So they start using that for development and they just don't have the guardrails put in place to have that whole multi-cloud infrastructure in one view. Yeah. I wanted to go back to the diagram that uh, we had put up before because in there, when you and I had previously talked, uh, you brought this great this concept of shifting left. You said shift left, and I'm going to tie this to multi cloud our uh, multi cloud expedition episode one, where when we talked about shifting left, we were talking about security, <clears throat> and we were talking about shifting that left in the development cycle, so that security gets um, more gets taken into account as the developer is developing, compiling, and deploying as opposed to at the very end, right before they're about to deploy, a security flaw is found, they include the wrong library, and as a result, they gotta go all the way back to the beginning, right? They should be, as they're developing, knowing if, hey, I can't use this library, so I better not make all my code dependent on it. So that was the shift left that I, I knew, and, and we covered that actually in multi-cloud episode, uh, expedition episode number one, now you're bringing together another concept which cuts across this collaboration, which is shifting finance left, right? Same thing, over on the left is the developer. So tell us a little bit more about what, what's the uh, current thinking on that. Yeah, it's really the transition from being FinOps in this concept from being reactive to proactive. Historically, we'd ship code and then teams would then after the fact, after it's running, try to go optimize for cost. And what the industry has found in the market is that's really difficult, especially because applications may not be designed in a way that supports an efficient infrastructure. So you think about things like spot instances uh, and being able to support a really elastic environment. If that conversation isn't happening on day zero with the engineers as they're designing it, it's going to require much more work and overhead to go back. So it's really a big shift of being proactive versus reactive with incorporating cost trade-offs into design and engineering decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, it's really interesting when we think about the that agile environment and being able to develop as quickly and utilize the cloud capabilities as quickly as possible. Great, but it should be done in a way that matches the objectives of the company and will deliver that return on investment that, that they're looking for. And I think you had even mentioned that some of the, the most mature organizations, um, they're really getting this kind of unit economic cost into the developer mindset. Maybe you could share a little more. Exactly. So the kind of journey that we see organizations going through with unit economics, it starts with cloud costs, which I think engineers are pretty used to. They understand that this is what an EC2 instance costs and that's the cost of it. Uh, but what they don't always take into account are all of the other costs, the cost of that data dog license, the cost of the service now license for the support engineer supporting that customer. So what we see the most advanced customers performing with unit economics is taking their cloud cost, but bringing in their SaaS costs for SaaS applications, bringing in their labor costs for things like professional services engagements to be able to start calculating these unit economic costs. And the kind of fundamental concept is that if your application is growing and you have more customers, your cloud spend is going to grow. If it's going down for a long period of time, that's probably a red flag. So sometimes it can be difficult for organizations to tell a story that, hey, our cloud costs are growing really fast, 
but things are good. Don't worry. Don't don't freak out. And so unit economics gives you that tool to be able to say, you know what? Our cloud costs are growing up, but our cost per customer, our cost per shoe is going down. So we're actually becoming more profitable. Our ROI is increasing, even though our cloud costs look like they're growing way faster. Yeah, that's a great point because you have to have that whole business picture in order to make the right decisions of where the investment is. Because you don't want to you don't want to throttle, let's say, cloud costs just because they look like if they're growing by a hundred percent, someone freaks out and says it grew by a hundred percent. Well, if the business supporting that also grew by a hundred or one hundred and fifty percent, then you want to keep spending money there all day long. Uh, that kind of business, I guess, knowledge and, and unit economics, would you put that in this last category? Oops, sorry. Uh, that business integration, is that kind of, is that where it kind of begins to pull things together? Yeah, at least typically that uh, later phase of bringing in things like SaaS costs and labor costs. What we'll see organizations doing is some kind of ratio analysis, KPIs earlier on in that visibility state. But really understanding how your cloud costs tie with your outside business systems, that really takes a level of maturity that we don't see many organizations at yet. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Then from cost, so we've covered some of the observability, a little bit of the capacity planning with Rajna, now cost with you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and shift to the next, the next section, which is security. And we're going to talk just a little bit about some of the fundamentals of security. So uh, with that, we can go ahead and um, play the next demo. All righty, back to Cloud Health. So in terms of security, Cloud Health offers a few different default security templates out of the box. And we offer a CIS for AWS and for Azure and a best practices for AWS. So I'm gonna click in and just show you what these look like. And what we're doing here is we're collecting your asset information using the cloud provider native APIs. And depending on the asset, we're either collecting these every 15 minutes to hourly, or for some assets, we've begun being event driven based on when that resource is launched. So for some of these, you'll actually see that we're collecting these within seconds of a resource being launched and made available through their APIs. But here's an example, just kind of clicking into one of these. So here is I am policy that does have an attachment to a specific user. And not only do we help identify what those resources are, those are down here, the affected resources, we also give you remediation steps. So this will help you and you don't have to be totally a security user to be able to use this, help you remediate those security vulnerabilities. All right, before we unpack that demo, uh, as a reminder to all the audience members that are online right now, um, we're gonna have both Lucas and Rachna at the end to take some live Q&A. So if you have questions, please drop those questions into the, the chat, and then we're gonna aggregate those and some other experts on the team are gonna be feel, fe uh, feeding us those questions to answer at the end. Um, but Lucas, talk to us a little bit about some of that basic, the basic blocking and tackling we just saw in the demo when it comes to multi-cloud environment and security. Yeah, so, so Cloud Health is not, we're a cloud cost management platform. Security is a pretty small part of it. But what we found, and I kind of joke about this, that if any of you have taken your corporate responsibility training for security, one of the questions may have been, who's responsible for security? Is it me, everybody, or just uh, security people? And the answer is everybody, giving you a hint. And so what we have found with FinOps especially is we have so much visibility into so much data that it is just part of corporate responsibility that we need to be thinking about security at this level. So for Cloud Health, we're at that. And then we also have a security solution as well outside of Cloud Health called Guardrails that I know that we have some people that are gonna be excited about talking about that in the future. Yeah, that's a bit of a teaser into our next episode. So this episode, very much some of the fundamentals of basic blocking and tackling of, of uh, observability, of secure of cost and then of security. But in our next episode, we'll be going deeper into some of those uh, into those exact topics. 
Uh, with that, let's go ahead and sh bring Rachna back. And then uh, we're also going to be joined by another member of the team, Leanne. And Leanne has got a couple questions that came in over the Q&A. Yeah, we've actually been getting some great conversations. So thank you, everyone, for, um, for the questions. And we'll try to get to as many of them as we can here. Um, so I guess one that just um, came up that I think kind of talk uh, that connects to some of the things, Lucas, that you were talking around about tagging and that aspect of it is actually being able to manage the cost specifically for a development environment um, and any kind of suggestions that you might want to bring up for folks on how we help with managing sandboxes. Yeah, so great question. And it's where we see a lot of demand for cost savings. Uh, so what we'll typically see organizations doing first is creating a perspective to track their sandbox resources. And then they will then, oh, did I cut out? Nope. Uh, and then they can then create these policies to develop alert thresholds based on what your spending limits are. And then, so you have this visibility for reports. You can create the policies to proactively alert you if any of those thresholds are hit. And then lastly, once you create a perspective, Cloud Health has anomaly detection and it will then run anomaly detection against your perspective costs to help as you launch up new resources, look at those tag values and give you a bit more predictability in your increased spending and projected spending. Nice. Oh, very good. And it sounds and like a lot of this ties back to the tagging that you had talked about earlier. Yeah. yeah. Now I'm going to ask kind of a, a, a question that would combine the two of you, Lucas and Rachna, which is those thresholds that could be put on uh, cost, right? And uh, then the same kind of thresholds can be put in the sandbox, in the operation side of things in order to make sure that a certain amount of memory isn't used or, or space, et cetera. So ideally we'll get to a point where almost all of that could be set up at one time, I would imagine. Is that true? Uh, you know, in terms of product integration, there is some product integration that does exist between cost and area operations for applications. And, you know, we do have plans to kind of bring these solutions that help in the cloud environment and really bring some of this cloud chaos and control. Uh, there are definitely plans in the roadmap to kind of. Yeah. And without putting you guys too much on the spot, this is more like. VMware, as we bring these things together, like first you saw uh, vRealize operations, right? And then that, you know, being able to pivot and have a management pack for ARIA for operations and then seeing cloud health become ARIA cost, right? These things are converging because for our customers, they want to be able to solve these problems to be as productive as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, and the thing that VMware does great is abstracting all that complexity, number one, into a simpler way to manage and operate and measure it. Uh, and then the next step is then making sure that the right yeah, guardrails are on it. In fact, that's a setup to, uh, to a future episode. But sorry, Lucas, did I cut you off? Would you want to mention something? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, that is really fundamentally the goal of ARIA. I mean, we all these products weren't called ARIA. We had Cloud Health, we had VR Ops, VRA, and we've taken all of these and created this ARIA product suite to be able to connect these stories. So absolutely, that is where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Perfect. And that, thank you. That actually kind of ties back into one of the questions that we had earlier, looking for kind of an AI aspect and, and trying to put some automation in place. So good to know that that's something that, you know, customers are still interested in, people are, are looking for, and something that we'll be able to um, to hopefully answer more on. And and it, again, another plug for future episodes. We'll, we'll continue to dig into some of this, doing some of the advanced topics next time. Um, one other one that came up, um, Rashna, is uh, is specifically around support um, for open source. And that's not something that we talked about. I know VMware does that a lot in general, but specifically ARIA for operations, um, oper ARIA operations for applications. Oh. Yes. Yeah, I know that is a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we do support OpenShift, which is a, a Kubernetes container platform that you can use to build and run applications, cloud native applications. We do bring full stack visibility for open shift environments, which is something that we see a lot of our customers asking for. And the, the open shift could be running anywhere. It could be on premises or public cloud and we'll support it. 
We also support uh, Prometheus. That's another common uh, deployment that customers have. So we can ingest Prometheus metrics. We've been doing that for, for a very long time. And then we're able to then query against it using PromQL. So we do support the prom query language as well. So then that is another open source uh, system that we support. So definitely have support for both. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I know we, it, there's definitely a lot of interest in that. So yeah, outstanding. Um, let's see here. And I guess kind of jumping back then, uh, we started to talk about this, but one thing I didn't I didn't quite clarify with you, Lucas, as we were kind of talking about some of the tagging and managing the costs for the sandbox environments, one question that actually also came up, which I thought was kind of interesting, is around logging. And especially as logs um, change in size daily, um, is tagging and something something that we can use to specifically capture logging, or is that kind of a different a different arena? Yeah, that's not really in the cloud off world in terms of tracking logging size. Um, yeah. that, that's a bit outside of us. We don't get okay. that granular. That granular. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I wasn't sure if maybe tagging or something could help could help with that because obviously logging is always an issue. But I know operations in general will definitely help manage uh, and give visibility into um, into what your the environment what's happening in the environment. I saw I saw one other thing that kind of caught my attention in the chat and. This is the idea of a cloud economics team that is starting to surface at customers. And so, you know, cloud, we've certainly heard of, you know, there's, there's teams that are doing strategy and operations, different business functions. Um, but maybe, Lucas, you could tell us a little bit more about what is, what is a cloud economics team? What are they supposed to, why are customers creating them? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, kind of different for every company and a bit of a trendy word. So what we typically will see, and when I think of that, is I think of that unit economics. And mm -hmm. the goal of this is to take the cost of a VM, which isn't actually usable for my business to be able to do something with, and actually taking that cost and putting some business context into it. So their job would be to think about things like, all right, what are all of the costs, not just cloud related, that go into us calculating our bottom line, our total cost of ownership. And that, if I think about the data center, going back to just the data center, there were certainly data center economics people figuring out the cost of cooling, the cost of power, the cost of all the different servers and trying to, and then figuring out, well, what is not only for capacity planning, but how are we getting ROI out of that? So interesting new teams. That's one thing about IT is it continues to evolve and uh, probably increase in, in complexity in many ways. So uh, good news for us, right? It always gives us an opportunity to become experts at something and then help deliver business value. Leanne, are there any other questions we wanted to get to before we wrap up? I think we've hit most of them. There are definitely a couple things that are coming up around security um, and, and just kind of how some of this ties into um, how this will actually tie into security and especially in the multi-cloud space. So. You know, I don't know, Alexander, if you want to you know, talk about for next time. Yeah, I think that's a great one that we are going to tackle more in depth. We recognize security being a huge concept, right, in terms of the, the vastness of it across a multi-cloud environment. So we're going to deep dive into that one in the next episode coming up in about four weeks, where we'll bring on some of the security experts from around the company. But what we did today was just give a little bit of a teaser since we had uh, you know Lucas on and, and has the ability to cloud health to instantly recognize when there's misconfigurations and surface those. That's basic blocking and tackling, right? Something new gets spun up and it doesn't have the right security parameters around it, well, you can surface that and at least uh, address it immediately. All right. Well, with that, uh, thank you both. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Rachna. Thank you for those that put in the, uh, the development um, uh, demos. Definitely appreciate that. Leanne as our moderator, Shannon behind the scenes, uh, as well as Dan also behind the scenes, working together to put together this show. Uh, if you're interested in seeing the next episode, highly recommend that you follow VMware and you can then you'll be notified when the next episode uh, is set. That will be sometime towards the middle to end of April, where we'll have uh, subject matter experts on deeper dive on security as well as cost and observability. So until then, uh, look forward to seeing everybody. If you have additional questions, you are always welcome to reach out to myself 
or Leanne or Lucas or Rachna, I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, address those questions individually. You can connect with them on LinkedIn as well as myself. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.